You know, certainly we know in our society today that character matters. I think it's something that is important. I said it last week, but you know, one of the primary roles that Scripture has is to tell us what kind of God God is. You know, it is interesting to me how many people, people engage with the word for all the things that God has done or, or the promises he makes, the commands he makes. And, you know, while I understand the rules, I understand the promises, I know the stories, but do you know the God that is behind that? And so that's why we're engaging the study on the character of God, coming to know and getting to know God in a, in a more substantive way. A more deliberate way, an intentional way. So we saw last week the character of God, the sovereignty of God. Uh, this week we look at the character of God, his omnipotence and his omniscience. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. Again, so, such important things for us to understand about, about God. Again, his, his power and his knowledge. So what do we mean when we say that God is omnipotent? The word means all power, force, might, strength. The ability to do, to create, and to carry out one's will. The word, the word comes from the Latin word omni, potens. Omni meaning all and potens meaning power. Although the word omnipotent is not used in the scripture, the concept is found throughout. God is called the Almighty, which is the translation of El, Elohim, El Shaddai in the Hebrew, and Pentocrator in the Greek. But another thing that's interesting about omnipotence is it's not only is it defined by words, but it's defined by God's action. God is almighty in his actions. As one author puts it, one may observe, therefore, the definition of omnipotence by its manifestations. It is known in concrete acts, acts indeed of overarching and overpowering inclusiveness in creation, nature, history, providence and redemption. And although I don't know what this author meant by in terms of this inclusiveness, I think what that means is that there are certain things that God has done throughout history that can only be explained by him doing it. And there's no other way to understand it as far as how we would define it. You know, reading through the Gospel of Mark, you know, on our, on our online Bible reading, we just finished that, but just struck me again, all the things that God did, well, all the things that Jesus did, that basically fix mankind in ways that mankind could not fix himself. Like people are truly amazed by his power in terms of him doing things that no one else could do. You know, again, people come to him, I've had this condition for 20 years, I was born blind, and here they meet Jesus and boom, it's gone. Boom, the issue is resolved. And so again, power that is expressed that again can't be defined by anything else, and that is the nature of the power of God. So again, the, the, another thing that helps us understand what omnipotence is, is by what he does. Uh, the Bible is clear that God's power is unlimited by anyone or anything other than himself. It's unlimited by anyone or anything other than himself. His power never declines or increases because he has it all. And his power is instantaneous. Once he makes a choice, it is done. You know, when you think about the glory of creation, all the things that we observe, all the things that are truly magnificent and powerful and creative and intelligent that is in creation. And think, what does the Bible tell us? God speaks. That's all he needs to do. God says, let there be light, and there is light. Now, if you're a scientist or engaged in any aspect of science, you know how complicated it is for light to exist. All the things that need to happen ju just for that. And yet all these things, God, God just says it and it happens. That is the nature of his power. So let's turn to Isaiah 40, 21 through 28. As far as scriptures that point to his power, the things that we would you know, give us permission to talk about God in these terms as far as his power. And I just love Isaiah 40, 20 through, 21 through 28. Uh, but both in terms of... You know, if you think that you, like, don't need his power, or again, you're one that's defiant, oh, yeah, you're powerful, who do you think you are? Or you're needy, like, God, I, like, I need you to be powerful, I know I can't do it. This passage is for both of you. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? This is Isaiah, obviously, talking to the Jews. Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. 
He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you care me, to compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. That's not a bad question for you to ask your soul. To whom will you compare to, to God, and, or who is his equal? Lift up your, your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Who do, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Again, that is God's declaration to us in terms of, again, do you understand me like this? Do you know me like that? Not only in terms of just the thoughts we think, or again, the knowledge we have, but do we live like that? See, that's the point that I'm trying to make in this series is, are we living like God is who he claims to be? Like, well, what is in my heart? What am I projecting? What am I living by? What am I hoping in? What am I believe sustains me? Is it this powerful God that can just do anything that he wants? As Job 9, 3 through 11 is another powerful place in terms of just a declaration of God's power. Though they wish to dispute with him, they cannot answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? His, he moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in, in his anger. How about, that? How about that about earthquakes, huh? He makes the earth from its, from its place. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pil pillars tremble. He speaks of the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the seas. He is the maker of the bear and, or, and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. Again, the glory of God expressed through the things that he has accomplished. You know, when we think about even the miracles that Jesus did, just like, it's amazing to me when the Bible generalizes the miracles that Jesus did. Have you ever noticed that in the New Testament when you're reading? And then they brought their sick and their lame and Jesus healed them. You know, a lot of times the Bible says, tells a particular story about a certain person being healed, but that's just like one out of a hundred, one out of thousands that he heals. I mean, to say that someone took a person that could not walk and then makes them walk and just say, yeah, Jesus just did that. Yeah, they, they heard that Jesus was in this area and they just brought all their sick and the demon possessed and whatever, and he just took care of it. Again, that's the expression of his power. That is the knowledge of what we have in terms of what God does. Genesis 18, 14 says this, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Yet yeah, it's even interesting, you know, this story obviously is with Abraham and Sarah, and something that God does in the, in the aspect of his power is sometimes he works through things that don't make sense. Like, it does not make sense to take a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman and say, by the way, next year you're going to have a son. Like, I, I'm the person, woman who has never had children, and she's beyond the age of child. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me just show my power. Let, let me show what I'm able to do. Like, you think that's hard? You think I can't do it? And then Daniel 4.35 says this. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven, the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Again, he, he, he does what he wants. He does what he's able, and he is able to do anything. I think in some ways the most challenging thing in the Christian life is to think, and what do I think and believe when God isn't doing something? And what we have to recognize is when God is not doing something, it's not because he is not able. It's never the case. I would even say that God is also not unwilling. 
Like, so when God isn't doing something, it's not because he can't do it. I would even say that he's not unwilling. The question in God's mind is always, is it right? So we have to understand that God has a purpose, God has a will, and all things that God will do is to accomplish his glory, is to accomplish that plan. And so part of engaging with this great God and understanding his power and believing that, letting that change my life, let, me ch- let it change the, like what I'm afraid of or what I am afraid of not being able to accomplish or do realize that there's nothing in the, con- in the economy of God that would cause us to think, again, he can't accomplish something, but then also to say, it's your will be done. You know, I think the reason why Jesus starts off the, his direction for prayer in, in terms of hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's to recognize that is our first prayer. That is the thing that conditions all the prayers that we pray, but then to understand that in the context of things we would pray, that it would be about power, that would be about ability. God, I know you're absolutely able, and I have that faith, and I believe that, but I trust you to do what is right, to what, is do, what to do in consistency with your will. And so again, two things we're covering today is omnipotence and is omniscience. And so as far as defining omniscience, in addition to being omnipotent, God is also an omniscient God. This means he is all-knowing. There is nothing that God doesn't know or understand. Past, present, or future are before him, and he knows all. He knows what is, what could be, what should be, and what will be. Like there is nothing that God doesn't know in terms of all the things the Bible says about God and what it takes in terms of the orchestration of his plan, when you think about all the world is unfolded before God, that before time even existed, God knew exactly what he was going to do in creation, what he was going to do in redemption, what he was going to do in sending Christ to the earth, and also what your life would be. He knew all of that And so therefore, that's something that the Bible professes and proclaims about him. And again, defining his omniscience. All prophecy in scripture points to God's omniscience. Every time the Bible, years and centuries before something happens, declares something about that. I mean, truly, the book of Daniel is amazing in regards to that. There's actually a a couple of chapters in Daniel where Daniel is so accurate about what he prophesies, that secular thinkers in their argument says that must have been written after the events. When all proof says it wasn't written after the events, it was written before, but it's so accurate saying, how could someone say this? How could someone show the unfolding of all these empires and the specifics about victories and battles and so on and so forth? It just shows that God knows all of it in terms of his knowledge. In Hebrews 4.13, it says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Again, there's nothing hidden from God. There's nothing that God doesn't see. There's nothing that God doesn't know. And then the next, Matthew 6.8, it says this, uh, do, you, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This is the context where Jesus is talking about the ways the Pharisees pray, and they repeat themselves and say it over and over again, thinking that by virtue of repeating it a lot, somehow God would hear. Like, God, can I have this? Can I, like, well, you know, maybe, maybe we act like we have acted with our parents, our children have asked, can I have the ice cream? Can I have the ice cream, Dad? Can I have the ice cream? Can I have the ice cream? It's okay. Like, like, like we, we, we think that if we, like, berate someone or, or just continue to bring something before, ah, you know, and how many times have parents, all right, stop asking me. If you're going to get the ice cream, you're just going to get. But see, realize, God does not have to be convinced to do something good for you. God, please, like, like really, like, a, like, you're trying to transform God's character to be nicer than he otherwise would do by the, rep- no. like, Jesus is saying, he knows what you need before you ask. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need you to ask him to be aware of your need or also to respond to your need. He, he just knows, and he's just waiting for you to ask. 
Because that's just a dynamic that he wanted to establish between his creation and his creator. I mean, sometimes there is a dynamic that we understand that, you know, sometimes it's just good to be asked so that when we provide, the person knows that we've provided it. So again, what does that do? It builds faith. It builds understanding. It builds relationship in God working that way. So he wants us to be engaged in prayer, but not because he needs it, but because we need it. And I just love Matthew 10, 30, and even the hairs of your head are numbered. Now, for some of you, that's a little less than others as far as the numbers are there. But really, God, God expresses this detail not because it's important, but to display the nature of his knowledge. Like, it does not matter to God how many, like, if you're bald this morning, it's okay. God's okay with the fact that, again, that he, you've given him an easy job. You have less hairs to count, so I'm glad that you don't have a lot of... He's not saying it for that reason. He's saying, if I know something that is hard to know... Like, it's hard to know. Like, at the drop of how, how many hairs do I have in my head? God, well, it's 1,000. If he knows that for everyone, doesn't he know more important things? Like, that's the point. It's not about hair. It's about the nature of his knowledge, that the hair of your heads are numbered. So therefore, trust me. I know what you're going through. I know what you're dealing with. And what does it mean for God that he is omnipotent, omniscient? We've seen what omnipotence and omniscient is. What does it mean that he is, for him, what does it mean that he's omnipotent and omniscient? I see these two attributes as the workhorses of the character of God. What I mean for that is that his knowledge and his power activate the other characters. In other words, if justice requires something to be done in terms of executing justice... His omniscient, I mean, his omnipotence does it. If, 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 if love requires some knowledge of understanding and appreciation for a situation that's going on or will go on, whatever, again, omniscience comes in and, and empowers love and informs love in terms of just what it needs to accomplish what it is desiring. So when you think about, you know, the character of God interacting with each other, and it's not like God thinks in those terms, but that's, that's a way to understand the way he acts, the way he is in terms of all the things the Bible expresses. And so, uh, that, so again, the, the, these attributes, I think of them as the workhorses. They're the ones that accomplish the various aspects of his character. They certainly factored into creation. Um, you know, so we've seen enough verses, I think, to, to, to say, we don't need to return to Jeremiah. If you can, like, look it up on your own. But ju just think about how, how often the Bible talks about God as a creator and, and, and that being an affirmation of who he is and, and, and something that is definitive in terms of who he is is the fact that he is a creator. Like even, even that, that chapter in Isaiah when it says, who are you going to compare me to? Who are you going to say is my equal? This is what I have done. I've created, like even when uh, God challenges Job at the end, when he says, like, did you know how to do this? Like, do you know the names of the stars? Were you there when I, let, when I set the sun in place and I told the waters they could go no further? Like, really? Like, but, but again, that, 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 that his omnipotence and omniscience factoring into creation. God holds things together by his power. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, a very powerful verse about, again, understanding how God engages in omnipotence with creation. For in him, that's Jesus, by the way, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rules or authorities, all things have been created for, through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all, all things hold together. You know, again, going to creation and just the nature of everything that is made. I mean, do you realize there's a little thing inside everything that is called an atom? And in the atom, there is a nucleus that has neutrons and protons. And you have these electrons that are going, going around. And, and such an essential part 
of what makes, thing, makes things work are those electrons going around. And so when I think of Jesus holding things together, I think he is the force that is going on. He is the force that's holding it together. My science son says there are four forces that define creation. It's, the, it's gravity, it's electromagnetism, it's a strong nuclear force, and it's the weak nuclear force. And my son said, anyone that wants further explanation of that can go to him. But as far as my understanding is that all those things are very specific. That when you talk about the, the values that need to be quantified to define that, if those things were broken, I'm talking about the very essence of everything. Like we, we see a, a, a table, we see our a table, a, a pulpit, a, a, a chair, we see ourselves and we just see the macro thing. I mean, the most simple aspect of our makeup is this atom that outside of this power holding it together, nothing would work. If, if, the, if the planets were not kept in their orbit, if Earth did not stay in its orbit, that's the power of Jesus holding together. And again, that's how powerful he is. The exodus, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, manna, water from the rock, and the other miracles in the wilderness showed God's power. And after these things happened, they became the things the prophets would remind the people of. Like there are two things as you read the prophets that, that, God, that God says to them. Remember, I'm the creator, and I'm the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. And what is that doing? See, that is encouraging them to believe because of his power, because I am strong, because I am mighty. Well, again, whether you're rebellious and you need to be humbled, or whether you're hurt and you need compassion, it's good to know that God is powerful. And that is the reason why the Bible constantly points out. He also, I mean, the prophets also say he's a God of mercy, he's a God of compassion, he's a God who forgives. All these things that, that the prophets remind the people of Israel of is this is your God. Don't you want to love him? Don't you want to believe him? Don't you want to follow him? But see, it's all established in do you know who your God is? And maybe you know it, but you've forgotten, and I'm here to tell you and remind you of who he is. I mean, you talk about wisdom and power that is found in redemption. I mean, two verses I just... <laughs> I just didn't have room on the slide, and I didn't want the words to be too small. And so Romans chapter 5, particularly in verses 18 and 19, talk, I mean, Romans 5 talks about the glorious plan of God that says that, you know, the reason why all of us can be saved by one man is because we're all condemned by one man. I mean, you think about... How God is going to orchestrate salvation? How is, he going to, how is he going to orchestrate us being made right with him? Okay, well, it could be every single person that is born can live their life. I can give them responsibilities. I can assess them in terms of their, their, their individual state. And then we'll see in the end, what does the balance say? I and mean, that's what people think, right? There's this great, you know, bad, this is great uh, what do you call that thing? Scale, there you go, a scale in heaven, but the old-fashioned scale, it's on this side of that. Well, you know something, if your good things outweigh your bad things, then you're good. That could have been a way that God did, that, did it, but he chose not to do that because that would just be a mess. And you know why it would be a mess? It's because we would never know. And God didn't want us not to know. And so what God did in his wisdom and his knowledge saying, you know something, the best way to do this is when Adam sinned in the garden, everyone's under condemnation. Everyone is judged before God because of what Adam did. Now, we as human beings might say, well, that's not fair, God. What do you mean I'm condemned because Adam was condemned? What, 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 what? But then, see, in his justice, and I don't want to bring up justice, but in his justice, he said, you know what that makes, makes it fair then? And I think it's, well, we won't get into, we'll get to that in justice. But <laughs> that now, because everyone is condemned by one man, we can all be saved by one man. And so, the, so, so, so therefore God both saves us and condemns us by one person, but then calls us to come to faith in Christ, to believe, to connect as a means that we connect to the work of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross 
is through faith. So again, we're not made right because the balances work out in a certain way. We're made right because we believe in Jesus. I'm condemned by Adam's sin, but I can be made righteous by virtue of the work of Jesus. For, da, 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 there's another verse that I didn't have room for on this slide. 1 Peter 2.24, it talks about how God took all the sin of the world and placed it on Jesus. I don't know whether that's omniscience or omnipotence happening, but there's something going on there that all the sin of all time, of all people, were placed on the body of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus is dying, he's dying for you. He's dying for everything that you would ever do in terms of your life and paying that price. So again, wisdom and power expressed in redemption. What does it mean for God that he is omnipotent and omniscient? Uh, the other attributes direct and moderate God's power and knowledge. As one author says, uh, as one author writes, God has power over his power, which is always under his wise and holy will. Omnipotence is not automatic, but it is willful. And so we'll let that be what it is. God's omniscience also means that nothing takes God by surprise or goes outside of his knowledge. Nothing shocks God. Nothing shocks God. God never says, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. What am I going to do about that? I mean, part of that is, oh, I didn't know you were going to sin that much. Boy, when, I, you know, when you came to salvation, you believed in Jesus. I didn't know. Boy, I didn't know you were going to be that rotten. No, he knew exactly how rotten you were going to be. He know, just knew how many sins you would commit. And he said, said yeah, I, still, I, I, want that. I want you. You can believe. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. And God had full knowledge of everything we would do when he offered us that salvation. That's complete his, how complete his redemption is, how complete his forgiveness is. Again, it's based in knowledge. So I think we go to what does it mean for us, right? What does it mean for us that he is omnipotent? We must choose to rest in the knowledge that God is omnipotent and omniscient, and allow it to f affect our decision-making. Again, to, for, for it to matter uh, uh, substantively in terms of our lives. You know, just, just think about what it would mean for your life if you believe God could do anything. Like, like what, what things don't we do? Do we not connect with? What do we, don't we rest in? I mean, what to be still and know that I'm God? I mean, what does that mean to you? Like, how often are you still? <laughs> how often are you at peace? How often do you have joy? How, how often do you worry and strain and struggle about, like, things you concern yourself with? I mean, I know myself, you know, when I've got something big coming up, and you may do this, or maybe I'm the only one broken you know, you're, you're up, you know, you got to do the thing and it's going to happen if this person doesn't do what they're supposed to do and I don't do what I'm supposed to do or the logistics don't come together or this isn't going to happen or that's going to happen and you're up all night and you're worried and you're fearful. Oh, you know, is that going to happen? But God, you're all powerful. And the beauty, the beauty of God's power is that now if things are broken, like, oh, it doesn't happen. God, like God knew that. So, so therefore, if it, now, now that does not make us passive. Understand that. That does not make, oh, well, you know, so I'll just, I'll, you know, I'm just trusting God. Oh, well, well, aren't you going to, like, call those people? No, I'm going to just trust God. No, no, no. no it's, it, you're pushing it too far. Because in, in the presence of this omnipotence, again, it's human responsibility. But in the context of our responsibility, in the context of us doing the things that God asks us to do, to recognize the backdrop of that, the support of that, that the default is the fact that God is powerful and God is able to so, so be still and know that I'm God. The worst thing you can do with a study like this is say, oh, I've heard that before. As if hearing something before is an indication that you really know it. The standard of knowing something is being in a situation where that knowledge is needed and being able to apply that understanding to cause you to think, speak, and act according to God's ways. That's knowledge. It's just not knowing something. It's just not having the information, 
But when all of a sudden a situation comes about that requires that knowledge, if it's not bearing the fruit of that knowledge, then you don't have that knowledge. Like if the knowledge of God being sovereign, God, the knowledge of God being omnipotent and omniscient doesn't change the way you think about life, then you don't know that. You might know it intellectually. And like you can quote the verses. You can have the knowledge, but you really don't know it. And so the whole process of the Christian life is growing in that knowledge, growing in that faith, growing in that understanding. See, sometimes, sometimes it is the failure in things that does promote the knowledge of things. Like in some ways, you know, like, like again, we, we, don't, we never in any aspect of life really, ex- but for the transforming power of God. Like the minute you learn something, you know it and you can apply it. That doesn't happen. But, but, but as we continue to engage in it, as we continue to experience it, as we continue to trust God a little and God comes through and now all of a sudden we believe more because I believe God and he came through. Well, now all of a sudden that increases my faith, increases my awareness of who God is. And that, but, but we have to engage in that process. Like we have to continue to grow in that understanding. You have to let these things minister to your worry, fear, guilt, and striving to handle things on your own. See, again, what does it mean for you that God is omnipotent and omniscient? You have to let these things minister to your worry, your fear, your guilt, and striving to handle things on your own. I think every time you don't pray, you're not welcoming God's omnipotence or omniscience into your life. If you're not in this book, you are not welcoming God's omnipotence, omniscience in your life. If you're not seeking the Holy Spirit, if you're not aware of the Holy Spirit being within you, and even when you're facing things that are challenging, you're overcoming sin, God, fill me with your spirit. God, I believe your spirit is there. I believe your spirit is encouraging and building and convicting and leading me into all truth. You know, rather than being preoccupied by the fruit Think about the person that is behind the will of God. The good thing that looks so good, but what about God? What about about his power and his ability that gives me to overcome? The next thing is we we must tap into the power of God. Again, those, those are the things that we, like an amazing aspect of the Christian life is that God shares his power with us. You know, I think that, I think of this more in the context of ministry more in the context of the call on our lives to influence other people. And again, uh, tapping into that power, the, the, the word, the worship. I mean, think about, think about a light bulb. Um, you know, when you think about, when you do think about a light bulb, that, that light bulb would, would want to light, it could, it could want to light as much as it wanted to. Like you could have a light bulb that is gritting your teeth and saying, I'm going to light and I'm going to be, shining light and do what light bulbs do. And, but if it's not connected to power, it's not going to work, right? Like a, a light bulb can be a light bulb, but it's really only a light bulb when it's connected to the power. Now, once it's connected to the power, it's very natural for a light bulb to be a light bulb. And that's what I see the Christian life more being. It's not a striving of, a, like you are a believer in Jesus. You are a new creation. Again, <laughs> Take away those heavy chains of, I've got a new name, and I'm a new, right. But, 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 but it's tapping into that power that exists. A visitor was once walking along a high part of the shore of the Dead Sea, and then he lost his balance and fell into the water. He could not swim, and in desperation, lest he should sink and be drowned, he began to fling, uh, fling his arms about. At last he was exhausted and felt he could do no more. Then he found something he had not known. The water bore him up. The water of the Dead Sea is so heavy with salt and other minerals that when he lay still in it, he found he floated on the surface. He could not drown so long as he resigned himself to the power of the deep. So it is with us. There is power beneath us and in us, around us, waiting to bear us up. We should cease from all our floundering and fruitless efforts that let the power of God undergird us. So again, it's tapping into that power. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4.13 and Galatians 2.20 is the life. um, 
I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me, that, who lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ, who loves me and gave himself for me. So that's the nature of the Christian life, the power of God flowing through us. And this is the last point. We must understand that we can be open and honest with God because he knows everything anyways. We can be open and honest. No, no use trying to lie to God. No, 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 no use trying to pull one over on him. It is fruit, fruitless to try to lie to or fool God. God knows everything about you, so come to him with your sins, your faults, and your need. And know that he is a God of compassion that is willing to meet you. But a God who's willing to meet you in knowledge and also the God who's willing to meet you in power to, to, to enable and equip and surround you with provision. That, 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 is, that is who our God is. That is what God welcomes us to understand and know about him, to grow into so again, we become transformed by virtue of that knowledge. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, we are grateful that uh, you are the God that you are and that you do make yourself available to us in, in the kind of people you desire for us to be, even the people we desire to be, and, and to know that you provide strength and you are strong. And Father, you don't want us to worry about the things we worry about. We don't, you don't want us to be riddled with fear. You want us to be free. You want us to have peace. You want us to have joy. And so much of that is trusting you, being still, and knowing that you're God, knowing that you are a God of power, knowing that you are, God, you are a God of knowledge, and being comforted by that. And so, Father, we lift this all before you in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.